We finally made it, the end of our 12 question series. And today we're gonna to talk about everybody's favorite topic to talk about in church, and that is money. <laughs> money. What does the Bible say about money? Now, before we do that, I'm going to give a recap of every tough question that we have covered the past 11 weeks. Are you ready? No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. That would take a very long time. When I was a little kid, my mom won the lottery. And by one, I mean that she got $450 for matching five out of six numbers. But my mom knew how to make things fun for kids, so she got all the cash that she won in small denominations, she put it in a bag, and when she got home, she had all of us kids sit down on our living room floor with our eyes closed. And then she took the bag of $450 in small bills, and she said, open your eyes, and she dumped the money over us. As I watched the dollar bills flutter down around me, I thought, this is amazing. We are rich. <laughs> I want to have money dumped on my head every single day. <laughs> Even though it wasn't all that much money, it was way more money than I had ever seen. And so I decided in that moment to commit my life to becoming Scrooge McDuck. If you don't know who that is, this became my very American love affair with money. And so as soon as I was old enough, I worked to make money. I loved that it gave me freedom to do what I wanted, to buy the things that I wanted to buy. But it also gave me the ability to make some pretty stupid decisions with the money that I now had. I bought all sorts of things uh, that were pretty foolish financial decisions. I identify with something Steve Martin once said. He said, I love money. I love everything about it. I bought some pretty good stuff. Got me a $300 pair of socks. Got a fur sink, an electric dog polisher, a gasoline-powered turtleneck sweater. And of course, I bought some dumb stuff too. <laughs> but in all seriousness, much of our lives is governed by money. Someone uh, recently remarked to me, they said, it's crazy. We go to school so we can get a job. We get a job so we can make money. We spend the money so we have to go to work to make more money. We are locked in this crazy cycle of working to live and living to work. Anybody identify with that? Ever felt that way? And they're totally right. Much of our lives is not governed by the Lord or our most important relationships. Much of our lives is ruled by money. But what if there was a different way to live? What if God could give us a different perspective on money? You know, the Bible talks about money a lot. In fact, I would be hard-pressed to name another subject that the Bible talks about more frequently than money. There are more than 2,000 scriptures on giving money and possessions in the Old and New Testament. That's double the number of references to faith and prayer combined. The Bible has a lot to say about money. Well, I'm not going to cover all that this morning, but I want to give you three things that the Bible says about money that run counter to what our culture says about money. So the first thing I want to say is that money is not evil. A couple of weeks ago, I was uh, talking to somebody about this topic. I said, in a few weeks, I'm going to be preaching on the topic of money. She was asking about our, our 12 Tough Questions series. And immediately she said, money is the root of all evil. Many people believe that's in the Bible but it's not true. What does the Bible say? We heard it in our New Testament reading. Thank you, Barbara Lang. It says, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Money is a tool. There is nothing inherently evil about money. The Bible says that it's our perspective, the, the orientation of our hearts and our minds 
towards money that is either good or evil. The Bible says that money can be an amazing tool for good or one of the most dangerous idols. The desire for money not only harms an individual's soul, it actually has a corrosive effect on society. Let's look at what 1 Timothy says in full about the love of money, the, the verse that was being misquoted by my friend. Here's what it says. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. The love of money is incredibly damaging to our souls and others. That's what the Bible teaches. And frankly, most of our culture is in love with money. There's a lot of self-inflicted wounds going on. The love of money, says scripture, is a bottomless pit. And this is confirmed by surveys. There's a 2015 survey of, of millionaires. So they surveyed all these millionaires in America, and 50% of millionaires said they did not have enough money to feel financially secure. Think about that. 50%, half of them. The love of money is never satisfied. Paul refers to it as a compulsive craving. Jesus takes it even further than that. He calls it a god. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. In the ancient world, there was a Syrian god called Mammon. They understood the power of money, and so this god Mammon was the god of money. And what Jesus literally says here is he doesn't use the generic word for money, he specifically says mammon. He says, you cannot serve God and this Syrian God of money, mammon. You cannot serve these two gods. The ancients understood that money was powerful and it could become an object of worship. The love of money, the craving for more money is demonic, according to the Bible. It's like worshiping a demon. It will turn you against God and lead to your destruction. Now, we all know this intuitively. Even non-Christians know this. P.T. Barnum once said, Money is a terrible master, but an excellent servant. If we can remember that money is not good or evil itself, but a tool to be used, a resource to be stewarded, then we start to step into a kingdom-centered way of living. Money stops, to be, stops being our master and becomes our servant, something that we can use to be a blessing. So that's the first thing. Second, money is not earned. According to the Bible, you have never earned a single dollar in your life. Now, before you go denouncing me as a crazy communist, let me explain what I mean. The Bible is clear from beginning to end that everything good that we get in life is a gift. It is not earned. But especially about money and wealth, the Bible makes a strong case that these specific things are especially not earned. In fact, in the Bible, it is often the wicked who are the wealthiest. Over and over again, we hear stories about very wicked people who are very wealthy people. We heard it in our psalm. That's what David is very upset about, right? He's like, I'm watching all of these horrible people, and their lives are awesome, and they have lots of money. He says, behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. Greed can make you wealthy but greed also destroys your soul, our most precious possession. 
But even when we aren't being greedy, the Bible tells us that it is not our hard work that earns us money and wealth. Just as the Israelites are getting ready to enter the promised land, right? They've been wandering in the desert for 40 years. Not a lot of resources, not a lot of ways to make money in the desert. Don't know if you spend any time there. Not a great place. Um, so they've been wandering for 40 years in the desert. And God says, okay, I'm about to take you into the promised land where you're going to have abundant provision. You're going to have more than you need. And then here's, listen to what, um, listen to how Moses warns them. Just as they're on the precipice of entering the promised land, here's what he says to them. Beware, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. This is radically countercultural. This goes against everything our culture says about wealth and money. According to the Bible, we cannot say that our power or the might of our hands have gotten us any wealth in this life. We can all probably agree that Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk probably don't deserve their wealth. Not all the wealth that they have. But it is much harder to admit that we haven't earned our wealth. Everything you use to make wealth was given to you as a gift. If you work with your hands, God gave you those hands. If you work with your brain, God gave you that brain. If you work with a gun and a mask, well then see me after the service for confession. But in all seriousness, everything we use to make money is a gift that we did not earn or deserve. Everything. Which means that every bit of wealth or money we acquire really belongs to God, not us. Because it's not our money. It doesn't belong to us. We didn't get it with our own power or our own might. It was a gift. And so if it's not our money, then that's an incredibly freeing place to live in, right? If it's not my money, then I'm free to be generous. I have a ton of freedom to be generous. And that can actually make giving a lot more fun and a lot less painful if you don't think of it as yours. So I want you to imagine... You know, I gave the, told the story about my mom dumping the money, right? What if instead of $450... Somebody dumped $2 million over your head. $2 million. That's a lot of money, right? That's a good bit of money. Said, here, here's $2 million. Make life awesome for people. <laughs> right? Wouldn't that be so much fun? If somebody gave you $2 million and said, go make the world awesome. Do something great with this. You could pay off someone's mortgage. You could send a kid through college. You could build a house for a family in need? Well, I got some news for you today. You have $2 million. You get $2 million, Jack. <laughs> Susan, you get $2 million. Harry, you get $2 million. Helen, you get $2 million. I'm being a little bit punchy here. Not today. You don't get it immediately today. But the average American earns $2 million in their lifetime. God gives you $2 million on average. Not all of us are going to make that much. But, but you, get, you get $2 million to play with, to be generous, to bless others, to do awesome things for them. Some of us will have a lot more than $2 million pass through our hands. God has given us this money as managers, as stewards, to make life awesome. The Bible uses a religious term for that. It says blessing, to be a blessing to others, but it means to be awesome, right? To make things awesome for others. The Bible teaches us to view money as a gift that we should keep on giving. We've received this money. We get to keep it going on giving it forward. So that's the second thing. Money is not earned. Third, money is not eternal. Money is not eternal. Listen to what Paul says. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, 
and we cannot take anything out of the world. Just as we brought nothing into the world, everything we have is a gift, right? We didn't bring anything into this world. We started with nothing. All of us started as naked babies, right? We didn't have anything of our own. Everything we have is a gift. In the same way, we can't take anything with us when we leave. And so the wisest approach to money is to invest it in something that does go with us when we leave, that does last for all eternity. Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where, moth not, uh, where, mo where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. <laughs> We have an opportunity in this life to make an eternal investment. When you give to the poor, you are putting money in your eternal savings account. That's, a, that's pretty cool. What a privilege. I want to tell you, because money is not eternal, God does not need your money. I've got a mostly, uh, I've got a love-hate relationship with this mic. It's mostly hate at this point, but <laughs> anyways, what I want to say to you is, I know that, you know, we're talking about giving, we're talking about money. I just want to say up front, God does not need your money. It has zero eternal value, but God gives you the opportunity to spend your money on things that do have eternal value. The truth is that the amount of money that we give doesn't matter to God. Whether you give a dollar or a million dollars makes no difference to God. After all, it's all his money anyways, right? We already established that. But it isn't true that we should only give what we want to give or what's in our hearts to give. In fact, Jesus tells us the exact opposite. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He doesn't say, you know, when your heart's in the right place, that's when you give. No, he says, no, put your money in a place and your heart will follow it. You'll be invested. In other words, make the investment and your heart follows. Our decisions and behaviors, the way we invest in this life, has consequences for the life to come. The question isn't, how much can I make for myself and my family in this life? The question is, how much can I give so I have plenty saved up for all eternity. What we give in this life determines what we will enjoy for all eternity. And the question before you this morning is simple. Will you reject the lies of our culture and accept the truth of God's word? Heaven is an extension of this life. Your money is not yours. God cares about how you manage his resources. Here's how Paul puts it. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Take hold of that which is truly life. Jesus, when he came on this earth, he had all the resources of heaven. And unlike us, he wasn't a subject, right? Playing with somebody else's money. Everything belonged to him. He was the king of kings and the lord of lords. And yet, when Jesus came among us, he surrendered everything. He lived a penniless life. And he died a penniless death. At the end, he even surrendered the clothes on his back. You remember that at the foot of the cross? They're, they're arguing over who gets his clothing. He surrendered his very body to his tormentors. He surrendered his very life to death. Jesus surrendered everything. He laid it all down. So I want you to think through your life. Think through all your current resources that God has given you. Do a mental inventory of what God has entrusted to your management. Your house, your car, your paycheck, your investments, 
your land. God's house. God's car. God's paycheck. God's investments. God's land. How might Christ, the king of all creation, want to use those resources for the poor and for the kingdom? You know, sometimes our possessions can start to take possession of us. If the king surrendered everything, what might the subjects be called to surrender? You should have uh, received a pledge card in the mail yesterday. If you didn't, it's going to look like this. You're going to get it. You're going to get one of these pledge cards. There's one on the information table, too. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to do something a little different this year with these pledge cards. And you'll notice they're a little different this year as well. Um, we have added a line on there for the Compassion Fund. Many of you don't know what the Compassion Fund is. The Compassion Fund at our church is used to help those who find themselves in difficult circumstances. People made in the image of God who maybe can't afford to pay their mortgage. People made in the image of God who have a surprise uh, car accident that's not their fault and their car's totaled. People who maybe can't, can't keep their lights on at home for whatever reason. And we use this money to help people. Um, we, we partner with ministries, Community Outreach Training Center and others, but we, we try to be the church that helps people um, when they come to us. And so we want, to, we want to continue that. And so we've added that line for you to pray about. But I want you to do something different this time, which is I want you to actually take this pledge card and carry it with you for the rest of this week. So if you got it already, stick it in your pocket, carry it around with you, because what I know is that in the coming week, you are going to get thousands of other pledge cards. You're going to get thousands of other pledge cards. You're going to get invitations to Black Friday sales, to doorbuster sales, to, you know, countdown to Christmas sales. And all these people are trying to get you to pledge your money to this life and forget the life to come. And so what I want you to do instead is I want you to carry this through this next week and say, I belong to Jesus, right? I'm going to make an investment in his kingdom. And again, we don't look at these cards. I don't look at these cards. We don't time to you. They're totally anonymous. We offer them up on the altar. This is not for our budget, right? I'm not making a sales pitch to get money out of you. That's not what this is about. This is about us intentionally walking through this week saying, Lord, in the year to come, I'm going to make an investment in your kingdom first. Your kingdom first. I'm going to make an investment. And so I want you to carry this with you. And then there's two cards right down on both cards. And next week, we're going to bring them as we start out our church year and offer them on the altar. You can turn in one, drop it in the offering plate. We'll offer that to the Lord. You keep the other one as a reminder. Say, I pledge my allegiance to you, King Jesus, first. Everything I have is yours. All that I have is yours. You surrendered everything. Jesus, you surrendered everything for me. And so I surrender all to you. I want to close. Uh, I invite you to pray a prayer with me. We're going to put it up on the screen. This is a beautiful prayer written by an Anglican priest, John Wesley. It's called the Covenant Prayer. I just want to close by praying this together. Would you pray this with me? The Lord be with you. Let's pray. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Thou art mine, and I am Thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen.